we've kind of settled in. And uh, so there's, you know, there's still lots to talk about. There's still a lot of things people haven't tried yet. The Jobs Act opened up some doors and allowed us to start advertising in a way that uh, people had not been able to do before for investors. This episode brought to you by Suites at Madison. Meeting in conference rooms for rent by the hour, week, month, or year. Suites at Madison, where business gets done. Check them out at www.downtowntampaoffice.com. Now, on to the show. You are listening to the Invest Florida Real Estate Show, covering topics in lending, buy and sell strategies, property management, hot markets, and tips and tools to guide you along the way on your path to real estate success. You want Florida investment real estate talk? You have come to the right place. And now, our hosts, Eric Odom and Stephen Silverman. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Invest Florida Real Estate Show. This is your co-host, Eric Odom, along with Stephen Silverman. Stephen, best time of the year to be in Florida. And then you leave. Well, I'm leaving. But I'm, I'm going to South Africa, but um, it'll be summer down there. But we can't complain about the winters here when I look at what's going on up north. Oh, man. it's a, Florida's just a terrific place to be. Uh, I, I will escape for a couple of days next week to do some skiing. I do that to once or twice every winter. But by and large, I mean, this is just a wonderful place to be this time of the year, of course. You know, we've got a lot of influx of folks that come from all over the country that want to be in Florida because of its uh, mild climates. You know, we regularly get contact from our listeners. We love you guys to call us. We've got a guy from Miami that had been a listener and uh, he's going to contract on an industrial property here in, in Tampa and he needs somebody with boots on the ground to help them with the management. And uh, they own a number of properties down in Miami, but you know we made the connection through the show and that's one of the benefits. We get to meet people and talk to people from all over the, not just the state, but all over the country. And, um, you know, they, they like what's happening in the I-4 corridor, that Florida is, has great weather, but it's also a great business environment. There's a lot of activity going on here uh, in, 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 in between Tampa and Orlando where they're ex- extending the high-speed rail and there's some transit projects. And there's reasons for the in- institutional guys to be excited about what's happening here. And so they, they're, you know, um, coming and sniffing around and we're more than welcome to uh, welcome them to enter our office and sit down and, and, and talk to them about helping them with their investment from a management standpoint or for helping with asset with um, acquisition too. So, you know, it's been a, it's been a quick brisk start to the year and pretty excited about what the future holds for us here as, as uh, the economy continues to kick along. Um, Wanted to give a shout out to our listeners. We've had a lot of folks recently that have been going on and giving us reviews. It's much appreciated. You know, guys, when we we work hard to try to bring folks onto the show, and it's not always easy because people are busy. They want to make sure that they're investing their time properly and that our listener base is one that they're going to be able to eventually do business with. That's why they come on. They tell their stories. They're either looking for deals. They're looking for managers in other areas or brokers in other areas or whatever it might be. So, you, you know, you guys help us by, in, in turn, help yourselves by putting reviews because when they're doing their due diligence of whether they're going to invest an hour to an hour and a half with us, they, and, and whether they want to be associated with our brand, they'll go and they'll look and see what our listeners have to say. And so you guys that are leaving reviews, um, are helping us and helping yourselves. So if you haven't done that, we really appreciate you going on and giving us a review. We'll definitely read it online if you say good things about me. It, I really like to read the negative things about Stephen. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so keep those coming too. Yeah, keep- <laughs> but uh, West 4141, uh, back in October, sent us a, a review and he says, a real, real estate investor in Florida, I really appreciate all this show brings to the table. Thank you. Uh, West 4141, we appreciate you. We appreciate you uh, listening to us. Um, Stephen, we got a great guest today. We certainly have. You know, as the, as the deal intensity heats up, people are looking for ways to really intensify their investments and do syndications. And it's important to stay current on that. So we'll roll right into our next speaker. Yeah. And I mean, syndication is the method that 
the investor can use to leverage their deals in their business. Um, if you're a single family home investor and you're wanting to buy bigger, bigger deals and uh, maybe you don't have all the equity, that's nothing to be ashamed of. That is the way everybody, literally every significant real estate investor, they use other people's money. They use their experience and they go and, and, and acquire investors that will, that believe in their experience. And so syndication is the way for you to uh, grow your business and acquire larger assets. So we're excited about talking to a Kim Taylor and let's go ahead and roll in. All of the information that we're going to be discussing today on this podcast is of an educational nature and should not be construed as specific legal advice, which can only be sought after establishing an attorney client relationship. We have with us today Kim Lisa Taylor. Kim is the founder of Syndication Attorneys, PLLC. She is nationally recognized corporate securities attorney licensed in California and Florida. Kim has been responsible for drafting over 300 securities offerings with raise amounts from 500000 to $100 million. Her firm provides the legal and marketing tools that entrepreneurs need to raise money from private investors legally, ethically, and profitably. She's the author of an upcoming book on how to syndicate. Kim, welcome to the Invest Florida show. Thank you, Stephen. Kim, we really appreciate, yeah, really appreciate the uh, time that you're taking to uh, talk to our listeners today. Uh, what, why don't you give us sort of a 30,000 foot view of how you got into law and how you got into this particular type of law? Well, I took a little bit of a circuitous route as many of us do. I went to law school. I actually was an environmental consultant uh, and professional geologist prior to becoming an attorney. I kind of looked into my future and decided I didn't want to keep uh, wearing steel toed boots and hard hats. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I wanted to do something different with my life. So I, uh, at that time, was living in Colorado and went to the University of Denver Law School. Thought that I was probably going to practice environmental law and actually did that for a while. But then I figured out that those cases go on for years, <laughs> and, I, and they're all about litigation, which isn't fun because right. everybody's fighting with everybody all the time, and nobody wins. So I decided I wanted to do more transactional-related practice, and I um, met somebody who was doing syndications and needed some contract work. So I started working for, for him as a contractor. And then eventually we formed our own uh, partnership. And uh, in 2016, I branched off on my own and set up a syndication attorney. And you're based in St. Augustine? I am. The other side of the coast. So it's it's nice to just quickly cross Florida and, and also get some, some input from the other side. We're going to talk a little bit about syndication. And, you know, maybe you can just tell us. Yeah, there's not new rules you, anymore, but there's right. been changes here. Uh, just But they're not new anymore, right, Kim? Well, yeah, but now we've kind of settled in. And uh, so there's, you know, there's still lots to talk about. There's still a lot of things that people haven't tried yet. The giant hedge funds are still shying away from the newer rules and uh, still sticking with kind of the old tried and true. So the Jobs Act opened up some doors and allowed us to start advertising in a way that uh, people had not been able to do before for investors. Well, why, don't we t- why, don't, why don't we talk about that? Let's just yeah, I mean, it, the Jobs Act, is that and it, it's only for accredited investors that people can advertise? Well, there's actually three parts to the Jobs Act that allow advertising. So the Jobs Act was actually um, passed by uh, legislation legislators in 2012, but then it took a, about another uh, year for the regulators for the Securities and Exchange Commission to propose the regulations that will allow people to actually start using parts of it. And so it was passed piecemeal. Initially, the thing that got all the buzz in the newspaper was something called crowdfunding. And crowdfunding really arose out of uh, something else, which used to be, we still call it crowdsourcing. It's kind of donation-based. So you raise funds, and it's not really a for-profit venture where somebody expects to give you some money and get a return on their investment. They're going to donate some money, and then maybe they're going to get the first, you know, prototype or something like that, or, you know, invited to the first screening of the movie. So that crowdsourcing had been around for a while. And this was really just kind of a new spin on it. So the the crowdfunding that the SEC originally envisioned uh, was where you could raise up to a million dollars from anybody as long as they didn't invest more than 2000 
and uh, you didn't have to look at their financial qualifications or anything as long as you had that. That has actually come into fruition and people can do that, but there's some limitations on that for real estate investors simply because you can't, it's hard to apply a million dollars to just about any real estate. It's really um, more geared toward people that are just needing a million dollars one time for maybe they want to start a business, a restaurant or non-real estate related business or something like that. Uh, you know, so, so that's out there, but you have to be able to advertise that through a, what's called a crowdfunding uh, portal. And that portal has to be registered with the SEC or with FINRA, which is the uh, self-regulatory agency for security. So that was the first thing that got all the buzz. Unfortunately, that's not the one that's really helpful for us. So there were two other parts of the Jobs Act that really are helpful for real estate investors. And those are the Regulation A+, and Regulation D, Rule 506C. So Regulation D Rule 506C actually sprung out of the original Regulation D Rule 506, which had been around since the 1980s. And that was the exemption that everybody used to raise money to, from friends and family and people who they had pre-existing relationships with. The problem with that is that they, you know you get a lot of these what they call country club deals, right? You got to know somebody in order to get into a deal like that. And it was really kind of exclusive because it was excluding a l- large part of the population that didn't know those people, so they couldn't get into these deals and all these other, you know, country club, uh, you know, clubbers were were getting the best uh, investment returns, and everybody else was really just kind of stuck with traditional investing. So, 50, Regulation D Rule 506C was one portion of the Jobs Act, and that actually relaxed that. Standard. So you no longer had to do these word of mouth deals. You were going to be allowed to advertise without having gone through the process of becoming a public company and going through regulatory scrutiny and approval. As long as the only people that actually make investments with you are verified accredited investors. So, so we now have Regulation D Rule 506B. So that's the original rule. So they just put a B behind it. And then we have Regulation D, Rule 506C. So on 506B, you can raise an unlimited amount of money from an unlimited number of accredited investors and up to 35 non-accredited investors. All of the investors must be sophisticated, but you can't find them through any means of general advertising or solicitation. Regulation D, Rule 506C, you can raise an unlimited amount of money from an unlimited number of verified accredited investors, and you can advertise freely. So, so therein lies the kind of the two distinctions. Sounds to me like if you're a newbie and you're trying to do your first deal, it's unlikely that everyone you know to be able to get the funds that you need to make the fund work are going to be accredited investors. So, I, I, right. they're, 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 I would imagine 506B is probably still the, the primary method that people are using for doing their syndication. Is that fair? It really is because a lot of people are, you know, I, they're meeting people at conferences and within their own sphere of friends and family and coworkers who are not accredited investors, but they have some money and they're, they're fine investors. And uh, most people want to be able to tap into that resource because those are the people you already know. And if you start by asking the people that already know, like, and trust you to invest with you, then you're going to have better success because the first time you go to a stranger through an ad and say, hey, invest in my deal, the first thing they're going to ask you is why? Why should I invest with you? Tell me about your track record. So until you have a track record, you need to talk to people you already know because they may never even ask that question. And if they are going to ask that question, you want to bolster your uh, credibility, then you can uh, you can team or partner with somebody else who's got some prior experience, and that can help you kind of leverage your experience off from theirs. So, so you mentioned thirty five non accredited investors. So you can do it just with purely as long as you're under thirty five non accredited investors, also. Yeah. You could. Yeah. They have to have some level of sophistication. So it can't be just somebody with a job who's never invested in anything before. 
Either they have to have gone through some uh, training or maybe you've provided them with some training materials or they've been parked on some training on their own or they've actually invested in other things like you're going to be offering mm -hmm. uh, in the past. You know, maybe they have other business experience, economic experience, um, some uh, education, something that kind of takes them above just a person with a job who's got some savings and doesn't know anything about investing. Let, let's focus a little bit on 506B because I would imagine that that the majority of the, the deals are done, at least initially, but probably even going forward as 506B. So let's let's spend some time talking about that and some of the genesis behind what's referred to as general solicitation. Mm -hmm. I think the genesis of that goes back to the 30s, uh, uh, post 1929 yeah. stock market crash. Uh, the, right. Yeah. And I understand the need with that. There are a lot of uh, hucksters and shysters who were pitching to old people. Uh, it didn't have to be old people, but unsophisticated investors, uh, crazy, uh, fraudulent schemes. And so the idea was to try to protect those individuals who were unsophisticated from these type of sophisticated fraudulent schemes that might entrap people. And so th this is the reason that we, we could probably go into an entire show of whether it's a uh, pro or, or, or con. I certainly understand the reason behind why it occurred, but then at the same point, it's somewhat limiting to the, to individuals that can really hit the ball hard. All, all of the Amazon, for example, started out first. In, in private world before it went public. And the people that got in buying the first shares of Amazon and Google made just billions of dollars. And they, they, their lives were changed forever. So the, the, really the opportunities uh, in private placement, it's all of the great wealth uh, creators in terms of business and real estate and everything else. They started out in the in, in private world and private placements give people access to that. But that's neither here nor there. The government, when they first when the Securities and Exchange Commission before Securities Exchange Commission sort of held people's feet to the fire and uh, and and forced uh, sponsors of these deals and the, the managers of these deals to only speak to those individuals who were sophisticated, and then there was a number that was attached to those that sophistication. Kim, what are those numbers now for an accredited investor? As far as the financial qualifications go, yep. the the current regulation and it hasn't changed for a very long time. Right, uh, is a million dollars net worth, excluding any uh, equity in your primary residence, and or okay, so it's, it's either a uh, million dollars net worth or two hundred thousand dollars a year income if the in investor is single or three hundred thousand a year income if they're married and that has to have occurred for the last two years with an expectation and it will continue into the future mm -hmm. so i just call it the one two three rule so it's either a million dollars net worth or two hundred thousand dollars if single or three hundred thousand a year if married so those are the accredited individuals. And then also one of the ways they put the brakes on being able to get the deal placed is the what's referred to as general solicitation. The regulators essentially said, you can't just post an advertisement in the New York Times and say, hey, we got a great return on this apartment complex or or whatever the investment is. Call us and we'll hook you up, right? That's what general solicitation is. Maybe you can be a little bit more specific in terms of the rules. Yeah, it's really, in this day and age, it's really advertising on the internet because that's what everyone wants to do. Sure. But it could also be advertising in Craigslist. I guess that's still a form of advertising on the internet, advertising in the paper. Um, it, it's really just putting um, the word out that you're looking for investors in any kind of a public forum. So where you're not in a controlled environment where the only people in the room are people that you've already kind of vetted and understand whether they're accredited or sophisticated or non-accredited. And what about if you don't have a deal yet, that you're just wanting to try to find investors and you're trying to find like-minded people? Is that considered general solicitation, advertising? No, because you're allowed to advertise your company. Or, you know, there's kind of this, this adage, you're allowed to advertise your company, but not your deal. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit simplified, uh, clearly, but... It's it's kind of something, a rule of thumb that people can use is that you're allowed to talk about what you do. There's no prohibition on you telling people, hey, I, you know, I work for a company that buys multifamily properties sure. and puts groups of investors together. 
jump in like that. Whatever you want to say. Of course, that's not a very good elevator pitch. I could have right. done that. <laughs> <laughs> when you do these syndications, are you doing any that are blind syndications or are people all or pretty generally have a specific property in that investors are uh, educated about? The ones that uh, are more successful offerings are the ones where there is a specific project in mind Mm -hmm. and investors can kind of see it, Google fly over it, you know, whatever they want to do to make sure that it's a real tangible thing. Uh, They like that. Investors like that. And the earlier a syndicator is in their history and in their track record, the more important that's going to be. Um, at some point, you know, when you get to a point where you've got you know, 10 or 15 properties going at once, you're going to have properties coming at you faster than you can take them down by raising money one deal at a time. And that's really when you'd start looking at uh, doing a blind pool. And there are still people that do blind pools. It is the hardest way to raise money until you have a very significant track record and a significant deal flow. And before we get too far down the path away from this point, I just want to continue to tie up accredited versus non-accredited investors in the deal, because I think this is an important point. And we've, we've talked a lot. I don't want to completely scare people about the accredited investors. You can't advertise. You can't do this. And that, that Just to remind people that on 506B, that there are 35 investors that are non-accredited but sophisticated, and these are your friends and family. And so this is why 506B is the preferred method, according to Kim, and you can always you have to correct me if I'm wrong, that that this is why is the preferred method, because you've got the ability to hit the accredited investors, but also go to the people that are most comfortable and most likely to invest with you on your first few deals. So don't don't turn off the podcast already because you don't think it applies to you. 506B is something that would you'd be able to dip into both pools. Yeah, almost all of our clients start that are starting out as syndicators start with Reg D Rule 506B. And and I've got some clients that have been with us for five or six years, and they still prefer 506B because they meet uh, non-accredited investors at these events. And those are the investors that are looking to invest in these kinds of opportunities. Mm -hmm. So it's really just kind of streamlines your ability to get more investors into your deal. And you're probably helping out some people that really need the money. Right. You know, that really need that investment for their retirement. Of course. Yeah. Now, let's let's continue on with Stephen's line, what he was talking about, which was the blind pool versus the individual pool. And so our listeners are thinking right now, you've created additional barriers for me here because now you're saying the ideal scenario is that I can go invest whatever I want, whenever I want, look at what I want. I know it's a good deal. I don't want to have to go to the market to try to explain that to people. But that's hard. Blind pools are hard because you have to have a track record before people will do a blind pool with you. And then they're, then they're going to say, well, that's great. Um, I can do... Uh, an individual one-off a deal as a 506B, but who wants to be tied up? How long is this going to take? Like if I go to contract, I need to be able to move quickly. No one wants to sit and wait for months and months and months for the SEC to approve something. So Kim, tell us a little bit about the process when you, the, the individual, what the timeline is for purchasing, for getting the, the docs put together and how that workflow goes. Sure. That, that's a really great question. What you're talking about is called a specified offering. So you've identified a property, you have it under contract, and you now need to raise money to get to the closing table. If you're going to have to syndicate the property, you want to get at least a 90-day escrow period. And ideally, if you can build in at least one, if not two, 30-day extensions, if you can build those into your contract up front, It'll be a lot easier for you to exercise those if needed than, uh, than it will be if you're trying to, to negotiate that a week before closing. It's going to cost you a lot more to do it the latter way, and you run the risk of losing the property and everything you've invested in doing the due diligence so far. So try to get at least, at least 90 days with at least one, if not two 30-day extensions. Uh, if you can do that, you're going to be in great shape. Uh, we have a whole lot of people who close with 90 days. Um, you should expect, uh, we say, we say you don't have a deal until you have a signed purchase and sale agreement. So your LOI is just an idea and, you know, you can call it binding and all of that, but it's really not, a, you know, it's a piece of paper and it's only as good as your ability to enforce it. So when you actually get an LOI accepted, you want to quickly get to the purchase and sale agreement, preferably with the assistance of real estate counsel 
located in the state where the property is because they're going to be able to help you avoid some maybe $100,000 mistakes just by knowing what should be in those documents and helping you negotiate those extensions. So we say you should actually hire us and get us started when you have a per- signed purchase and sale agreement, you've uh, looked at the last two to three years of income and expense statements, and someone from your team has physically been to the site. So the trick is to try to balance all that and get it all done as soon as possible, but to spend the least amount of money you possibly can spend until you've got that signed purchase and sale agreement and you've done those three things. You've physically been to the site, you've reviewed the last two to three years financials, and you, you've got that signed purchase and sale agreement. So if you can get the financials before you even get to the purchase and sale agreement, that's perfect. It, don't go hopping on a plane, though, until you got a signed purchase and sale agreement because you may never get one. And the fin- and the reason that I say that is I've actually, my husband and I have a syndicated property. I've been through syndication boot camps and training and coaching and all of that, too. And, and I've helped all these clients. And we can see that, you know, those deals that have been through those three things are 90% likely to close. So if you get us started working on the syndication documents at the same time you're conducting the rest of your due diligence, then we can ideally we can finish the documents at the same time your due diligence period ends. So we should be finishing the documents around day 30 to day 45 of your purchase and sale agreement of your escrow period. And then you're going to have that next 60, 45 to 60 days to be able to go out and raise the money at the same time that the bank is processing your loan. While syndicators are going out, and, and I'm thinking of new syndicators uh, specifically, um, you mentioned the internet. Are there any channels that you find most productive for them? Is it individual websites? Are they going to certain places? Uh, how, how are they finding investors? The best way you can possibly find investors is by word of mouth, even if you want to advertise then you still need to be able to follow up with those investors face-to-face or at least voice-to-voice. Um, you know, you can do face-to-face over the internet. You don't necessarily have to be in the same room. But the more live human contact that you can have with those investors, it's far more likely that they are going to be to want to invest with you. So people go to real estate training events where there's a large uh, number of attendees. To meet prospective investors, that seems to be pretty fruitful. Just joining philanthropic groups in your local community. Sometimes it's good to get out of the rooms where everybody's an investor. You know, that might be a source for you, but everybody else is, is hunting that same source. You know, so the, uh, the forest is kind of tapped out. Mm-hmm. Right? So you need to maybe go to uh, some other places where you are the only investor and join some other groups and um, get to know some other people. But you really just got to be in contact with as many people as possible through meetups, social, business, um, any other you know, church, any other uh, way that will get you out of your house, out of your basement, out of, of the front of your screen, and in front of other people that you can talk to live. Do you see any or much debt options for in, on the investor class? I, I know that typically banks are stepping in if they, you know, let's say they're lending on 50% of the value on a syndicated deal and then some portions coming in equity from your raise. Do you see much debt being solicited to investors now, Kim, or is that, is that sort of not happening? It's kind of a thing of the past for the time being, unless you're doing single family residential, in which case that's a rich, you know, a rich place for investors to go. People who have self-directed IRAs, cash, whatever they want to invest, uh, you'll see a lot of them serving as private lenders mm-hmm. to the single family fix and flip community, mm-hmm. um, or even to the single family buy and hold community because the dollar amounts are fairly small. And uh, they can, they, there isn't an institutional lender in the mix. When you get into the commercial properties where an institutional lender is providing a first position loan, if they are a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac backed loan, which is, uh, for instance, most of the multifamily, which is the bulk of the commercial transactions that are happening in this country right now, um, are Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac backed loans. And both of those loans 
loan types have prohibitions against subordinate debt ever since 2008 and, and uh, you know, Dodd-Frank Act uh, when, it, when that was finally passed that kind of kiboshed that whole um, subordinate debt. So lenders won't allow you to have subordinate debt. The way that it's done, though, I mean, you can still have someone that comes into an LLC and virtually gets the same thing that they would have had as far as a return if they had had a promissory note. But what the lender doesn't want them to have is a promissory note with a remedy for default. Because the lender wants to know, the guy I'm vetting right now and I'm doing my due diligence on is the guy I'm going to be dealing with, no matter what happens to this property, whether it's you know a, a smashing success or it goes down in flames, this is the guy I'm dealing with and that's what I bargained for. They don't want to have a second position lender that can come in and, uh, you know, they, they get defaulted on first, then they come in and they foreclose. Now they're in the position of the, uh, the borrower on the first position loan and the lenders just won't allow that to happen right now. Mm-hmm. And, and I think, you know, with you mentioning IRAs, it's important to, to note because I know that a lot of our listeners are IRA investors, self-directed IRA investors. Um, and they, their, their antennas are going up. They're going, yeah, that sounds like a great opportunity. Make sure this is out of the scope of our conversation, but you've got UBTI that you need, which is, um, unrelated business tax income. Is that correct? And tax, taxable income. Taxable yeah. income. Right. And, and that's, 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 that essentially, uh, is meaning that if you're investing inside of an IRA, that you're exposing that return to tax consequences. And many are getting into the IRAs because it's a deferred tax environment, but it's something you got, you have to think about. Sometimes it's the best return you can get and you go ahead and you pay the taxes and, and everything's okay, but it, you need to be aware of it. Don't be shocked by that. If you're, if you're in, in, uh, with uh, investing inside of an IRA that you might be exposing yourself, talk to your tax, to your, uh, your tax consultant, your CPA to make sure that you're on the right side of that equation and you're doing your, your, your investment returns uh, properly. So let me ask you a question with the deals that you see being done. Is there a typical structure on how the waterfalls work or how the returns? I mean, I know they're all over the show, but I'm sure every deal is different. But just as a general example, how would you see the returns to investors and the sponsors? So the sweet spot is and has been for a very long time, uh, 8% preferred return to investors. So that's going to be calculated against their unreturned capital contribution. So if you get an investor who puts in $100,000 and you offer him an 8% preferred return, then you're going to offer him 8000 8, You're going to owe him $8,000 at the end of the year. Uh, it could be that your property doesn't generate 8% uh, to pay him during that first year of operations. Maybe you only have enough to pay him five. If it's a cumulative preferred return, then that unpaid 3% would continue to accrue and could be paid back out of subsequent uh, operation cash flow or from a capital transaction such as a a refinance or a sale. Um, So the 8% is kind of just an accruing return. Um, And then usually a share of equity at the time of resale which is usually happening sometime between, you know, anywhere between three and 10 years. Uh, five to seven is very common. 10 is kind of on the outside, but we're, we're seeing some more of those 10 year deals. So you've got to, with the share of equity, it's going to be somewhere between, say, 80% of the, what we call distributable cash or, uh, that somewhere between 60 to 80% of the distributable cash usually gets distributed amongst all of your cash investors. And the rest is usually retained by the management team. And so when that big chunk is received at the end, so you've done something to the property over the period of time you've owned it, you've added some value, there's been some appreciation, you've increased rent, and now the property is worth something more than what you originally paid for it, and that uh, equity that's realized on the sale, then whatever you get out of that, that's what gets split according to those percentages. So typical split is 60-40, between 60-40 and 
And and so I just taking that kind of all the way through is what the the projections what the projections are trying to show is that you're really uh, you know that eight percent return preferred return plus whatever you get from that big chunk at resale. If you spread that amount out and added it to the eight over the years that you've owned the property, then you would have somewhere in the mid to high teens as an uh, average annual return, so AAR, average annual return. Okay. And, you know, a, lo- a lot of people have been out in um, doing syndications and, and or thinking about it. Could you pick maybe like three mistakes that syndicators make? Oh, when, when yeah, whatever. Are, what do you see the most common, the handful of most common mistakes that you see people make, Kim? Waiting too long to hire a securities attorney because a lot of people are afraid to pull the trigger on their securities attorney because it's a check of cash. And, um, you know, so they wait until they're done with their due diligence. Well, if you go back to that timeline we talked about earlier and you only got 90 days and they now they're for, at day 45, and the one thing I didn't say before, which you need to know, is that it takes three to four weeks to get a good set of offering documents uh, completed. So that's between the time that uh, we draft them for you, we gather information from you, uh, we draft them, we give them to the client. They we usually end up going back and forth a couple of times on incorporating uh, comments and uh, making sure that they're correct and then issue the final doc. So so we're working hard to uh, streamline that process right now, and hopefully we'll be able to condense that a little bit in the future. But for right now, your average timeline is three to four weeks to get your offering docs done. So if you wait until day 45 and then you hire your attorney and it takes four weeks to get your offering docs done, and you only got 90 days to close, you got two weeks to raise the money. And those people don't close. Um, The other people that don't close are people that haven't done the legwork up front to be able to have a ready database of prospective investors that they can call on when they have a deal. So what you need to do now before you have a deal, and this this kind of goes to the whole 506B pre-existing relationships um, and, uh, you know, the prohibition against solicitation is you have to have a pre-existing relationship before you can invite people into your Reg D rule 506B offering. And that pre-existing relationship is it means that before you make offers to people, you already have to know enough about them to understand whether they're accredited or non-accredited and to make sure that they're sophisticated. So that means you would have had to have had a conversation with them about their finances and about their financial goals and to determine their suitability before you could actually make an offer to them. So... That means you got to go out and meet people. You gather their contact information. You have to have a follow-up system where you gather that information from them. You're actually vetting those investors. Now you're putting them on your list. And then something has to happen because if you met somebody six months ago and now you got a deal, they might not remember who you are. Right. So what have you done in the meantime to try to keep in contact with them? So you really need to establish some kind of a newsletter or a drip system or some method of keeping in contact with with people that you do meet. So once you've taken those steps and you get that stuff um, set up, now you're going to be in really good shape because you're constantly in the marketing business. You're constantly meeting people. You're constantly adding them to your database. Um, The SEC says the uh, median raise uh, for a Reg D Rule 506 offering is $2 million and it has 14 investors. Uh, kind of rules of thumb from some of the gurus out there is you got to have three times as many as investors as you need for your deal. So if you need 14 investors to raise $2 million, then you need to have three times that many people. You need to have about 45 investors at least in your database. So start with the people you know now and then come up with a plan for how you're going to go out and meet additional people and get your marketing tools in place so you've got something to show these people in some way to keep them engaged. Very good advice. You know, we're talking about mistakes that people make and I don't know how many times I've heard it, sponsors or people that are trying to put together these types of deals say, well, I've got three guys and they're going to fund this deal and they're each coming up with 750 It's amazing uh, that you wait three, five, six months and all of a sudden you go back to those three investors and one of them won't return your phone calls anymore. Uh, another one of them tells you that uh, the $600,000 well, his wife 
uh, just bought a second home in Naples and, and he's only got a hundred thousand dollars. And the third one says, uh, well, you know, my wife, uh, or my husband is now, uh, getting cold feet and we'll take a look at the next one. We'll take a look at this one. And you're sitting there in contract and already invested a whole bunch of time and money into it. Think you had three guys in your pocket and you, now you've got almost nothing. <laughs> Yeah, Eric, you are, you hit that nail right on the head. That is probably the biz, biggest mistake. I call that, uh, seeking whales, right? And, and I, when I really teach syndication, I always teach it saying, if you've read the movie Moby Dick, I just want you to think about the whale and the, the wake of destruction that that whale left in its path, because that's what whale investors can do to your deal. Yeah. So you go off to tuna, yeah. lots of tuna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good analogy. That's excellent. <laughs> yes, there are a lot of a tuna. If you go after the tuna, you will fill your plate and you will also keep control of your deal because that's the, you know, the not only do they disappear or does their money evaporate, they also, uh, some of them are a little bit predatory, right? When you go after these yeah. whale investors, they know you're in a pinch and the their terms change right before closing. And sometimes they change so yep. much that you can't even do the deal or you don't want to. And then once you're in the deal with someone like that, they really don't need you anymore. And they got all the money. If they want to get rid of you, they'll just find a way to get rid of you. Yeah. And they'll just keep the deal for themselves. So it's, it's just not a good idea. And tuna's tasty. Yeah. And, and, and with tuna, you can get a net income. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to okay. stop. <laughs> I'm going to stop. Um, Kim, um, we can go on the rest of the, the, that's right. The rest of the show with the tuna analogy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, if people want to reach you, what's the best way for them to contact you? The best thing to do is to go on our website. It's syndicationattorneys.com. And on every page, you'll see get a free consultation. Go there. But while you're at our website, I would highly encourage you to go to the Knowledge Center. And look, because we have a ton of free information about syndication on our website. We have about 30 articles posted, and they're all like one or two page articles, so they're easy to read. I'm just breaking down, you know, what's a pre-existing relationship? What's the difference between 506B versus 506B? How do you structure a real estate syndicate? You know, it's it's all there. In addition to that, every month we hold a free monthly teleseminar. And uh, we bring either I talk on a subject for an hour or we bring in uh, somebody else who has some service that you're going to need as you grow your syndication business. So um, we have posted all of those past teleseminars on our website. So you can get all that information mm, for free. Uh, FAQ. And then also visit our web store because of those marketing materials that I was telling you about, those marketing tools, we're now starting to offer those because we had so many of our clients that couldn't find competent people to generate those materials for them. So we finally said, you know what, we're just going to start doing this in-house for people. And now we have some of that stuff available too. So so do check that out and uh, let us know if there's any way we can help you. We'd love to talk to you. And we, when we offer free, free 30-minute consultation. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Good stuff. And we'll make sure that our editor gets links to your website on our note section of the podcast. And uh, Stephen or Kim, is there anything else before we what, go fishing, I guess? Huh? Yeah, we'll go fishing. <laughs> well, yes, that's right. well <laughs> look for the book. Uh, I finished my draft of the book that I've been working on for a very long time on New Year's Day. So that's with the publisher right now. So we hope to get that out within the next uh, two to three months. Congrats. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. Let us know when it comes out. We'd love to see it. Yeah. Thank you. We'd love to share it with you. Well, Kim, we appreciate your time that you invested with us today. And that was Kim Taylor from Syndication Attorneys. Stephen, what were your thoughts? Always love to get people talking about syndications on here because this is how investors can can grow their business and get bigger deals. So what were your thoughts about what Kim had to say? Well, a lot of practical advice. You know, one of the things I was thinking of when Kim was talking that in if you're looking for a handsome prince, you've got to kiss a lot of frogs. Or tunas. Or tunas. You've got to throw out a lot of lines. But she said to get 14 investors, which is the standard deal, you need to have at least 52 investors In lined up, prospects. Yeah, prospects, because they will leave you at the altar. That that I, from my days of raising funds 
uh, on syndication deals. Um, vast majority of them are going to not return your phone calls. They're going to ghost you suddenly, suddenly, be- and they will tell you up until the time that you got to put the ring on the finger that they are in, they are in, they're in, and then they're not. They're in until they're not. And uh, you know, my partner used to say, you know, a lead's a lead until he signs a contract. A lead's a lead. So you know, you just got to keep, uh, uh, you know, using a football metaphor, the uh, FSU. Uh, Football coach, when they Florida State played Florida years ago, and they were uh, continuing to hit the quarterback after the whistle, and he said that he plays his football players play to the echo of the whistle. So I think that's what you have to do with getting investors <laughs> is you have to play through the echo of the whistle, and uh, to make sure that you get your the funds raised necessary to get your deal closed. Uh, Stephen, anything else? Well. For more interesting information, go to our archives on the www.theinvestflorida show and put the podcast on your listen list. Um, you can get it on iTunes or Google and uh, listen while you're driving or mobile. Uh, we've got some really good material up there now and we appreciate everybody contributing to it. Guys, as always, we appreciate the time that you invest with us each and every episode. And until next time, hasta la vista. You've just listened to the Invest Florida podcast with Eric Odom and Stephen Silverman. Join us every week for actionable real estate investment ideas. And of course, visit our website at www.investfloridashow.com for more shows and tips on how to earn a cash flow in the real estate market in Florida. While hosts and producers of the Invest Florida show have no reason to doubt the validity of comments of our guests, we do not warranty their accuracy. Please check with your legal, financial, and tax advisors before entering into any investment. Returns will vary from person to person and deal to deal based on unique circumstances. All information expressed in this show is for educational purposes only. Opinions of the guests are not necessarily shared by the hosts and producers of the Invest Florida Show.